and, and what else? Next, what? I'm sure the people in the synagogue were thinking that as Jesus was reading the scroll from Isaiah and he stopped saying about uh, helping the poor and, and proclaiming the year of the Lord, which meant the jubilee coming up, and then stopped. There was more. If you read Isaiah 61, 2b and continue on, it talks about Israel's reclaiming and crushing their enemies. Jesus doesn't mention that. Curious. So is he just doing a little bit of his own eisegesis? He takes what he wants out of Scripture and applies it. He doesn't want to read the whole thing, but just takes little bits and pieces like we all do to suit our own needs and our own mission in life and our own whatever. But and, and, what next? Well, it kind of leaves people thinking all kinds of different thoughts, like you're thinking right now. Where is he going with this? And then Jesus interrupts. He kind of gets an idea of what they're talking about. He says, uh, by the way, you're probably thinking, you know, there's a lot of stuff here that needs to be taken care of. Why aren't you giving us the same as you did everybody else? And Jesus is one of those quiet I picture him as being one of those quiet guys that can offend you without you even realizing it until later. What? Did he just say what I think he said? It wasn't like a hit over the head. It was just kind of this, this uh, sliding truth that comes in and, and it blindsides us. And think, whoa, I, yeah, you're right. The people in Jesus' hometown had this sense of this is our boy. You know, Brett Favre is our boy. Why is he going to Minnesota? Why is he going to Philadelphia or the Jets or wherever he's going? He's our, he's our boy, you know, Donald Driver. He's our boy. He doesn't want to play for anybody else. He'd just rather retire and stay here. That's right. We have this sense about this is our man. And the hometown was saying the same thing about Jesus. He's our boy. He ought to take care of us. And sometimes family members don't necessarily take care of each other the way they should or, or need to or, or what have you. Jesus read this snippet of this Isaiah text to challenge, to, to get people to say, it's not because you're entitled. John the Baptist had the same problem with the Hebrews coming up and said, well, we're sons of Abraham, of course we're saved. And John the Baptist, you know, he said, hey, I got these stones to convert rather than save you guys. So where's this all leading? Jesus is offending his hometown people that he grew up with. And then he goes off and gets something and comes back and doesn't give them what they wanted, what they expect from him. So now they're a little bit ticked off. Plus he goes on and tells them, hey, these two incidents in history, your history, our history of helping someone else, actually helping our enemies. Naaman the Syrian was not our friend. But that's the way it is. What is Jesus getting at? Why did he stop it there to challenge us? To get off our butts and do something else? To proclaim the year of the Lord, the Jubilee, where things are once again evened out, where people get their land back, get, get equity again, and there's not this rich and poor divide, but now we've got more of a middle class kind of thing where people are taken care of. And he challenges them. He challenges their entitlement, their sense of of entitlement that they can sit back on their laurels and just take what they can because they happen to be related more than likely to Jesus. Are they willing to follow what he's telling them? I don't know. My daughter won't listen to me. Some other kid will listen to me. My daughter won't tell me. My daughter's teacher said, don't you think for one second that I don't tell my daughters five times to brush their teeth because I do. They're not going to follow me necessarily. And I find out that when she's in somebody else's house, she's an angel. She does this, everything. She, you know, she was really good. She is polite and she took her plate to the sink. And I said, are you talking about the same daughter that, you know, she's not going to listen to me. These people in, in Nazareth are not going to listen to Jesus because he's one of them. You know, hey, we're familiar, maybe too familiar with that. And so this leads to rage. Interestingly enough, this biting words of Jesus leads them to 
because their feelings are hurt, because their sense of entitlement is challenged, now they do what they do best is they want to go to physical violence and throw him off, kill him. How dare he say this to us, his family, his people who raised him, his peeps. They can't do that to us. We're not going to listen to one word he says because whatever. So it leaves them for physical violence. How often have that, has that happened for us? Our sense of entitlement is challenged. Our, our sense of entitlement is, yeah, challenged. And we resort to violence. We're going to fix those people because... Martin Luther had a sense of challenge to our society. This is not right. Rosa Parks, Martin Luther, Gandhi, all these people that challenged the status quo, that challenged a sense of entitlement for what was right, for what more is in line with what God's mission is in the world. And people respond with hatred, with let's just get rid of the problem. There's the problem right there. Get rid of them. They didn't want to follow. We're in a culture that is really not too much of followers in a sense that we celebrate leadership, don't we? We train our kids to be leaders. And you've heard the story about, you know, there were 500 kids accepted to the school and 499 were leaders, one was a follower. Why? Because at least that one could follow. My brother took a bunch of seminarians from Chicago down to Mexico City to to check out the Lutheran Center down there, and they had all these places, the, the city of cardboard boxes down there where the poor of the poorest lived. And he said there were so much problems down there from the, the seminary students. Why? Because nobody wanted to follow. They all had to be leaders. And so they constantly butted heads because no one wanted to follow. Our culture accentuates that. It trains people to be leaders and not so much followers. And that's how problems can arise. When you don't have a sense of when you're leading and also when you can need to follow in order for, for something else to come to fruition, so something extraordinary can happen. Being able to follow is, is an important part of our lives. But we must be as clever as foxes in whom we follow, correct? We don't want to follow somebody who's going to be steering us in the wrong direction from the deep faith that we have, that we know where Christ is leading us. To be able to take those steps in faith, sometimes without knowing exactly what the destination is, but knowing who is leading us. The Holy Spirit leads us, sometimes in paths we don't even know where, where we're going. Are we able to follow? Can we do that? Do we have the wisdom to know when to back off and to be able to follow or to lead when we need to? That is a constant struggle throughout people's lives. To be a great leader is to be a great follower. Anybody worth their salt in leadership has a mentor, right? Someone who is older, more experienced, to, to listen to, to bounce ideas off, to ask questions of, to be challenged by, so that they may grow. Even at an older age, you still have your mentors. You still have those people you look up to and, and seek advice for. We as leaders in this community have an opportunity to listen to what's out there, to listen to the pain and the struggles of our community, the pain and struggles of each other, and to lead when necessary, to follow when necessary, so that we can benefit each other, so that we can proclaim good news to the poor, unbind the captives, help the oppressed, proclaim the year of the Lord, all these things that Jesus was reading and talking about in that synagogue on that one morning in Nazareth. He had his day planned, it changed. They changed it for him. I'm sure he didn't expect to say to himself, I'm going to read this and they're going to throw me off a cliff. No, uh, not at all. The hope in that is 
even though the people who felt a sense of entitlement that they knew what was best and that this Jesus sort of knew what he was talking about, but not really because he wasn't going to help us, throw him off the cliff, yet it says that Jesus eluded them and got away. I'm assuming that he went to somewhere else that, that somebody else had need for the message, for the person of Jesus to bring healing and truth where it would make a difference in people's lives. The Jesus that we try to throw off the cliff when we decide that we don't want to follow him because that doesn't make any sense. And sometimes the faith, the gospel, does not make any sense. Sometimes it runs counter to everything in our culture that tells us is right. But this Jesus doesn't let it happen. We can't get rid of Jesus that easy. He is stuck with us through thick and thin, through trials, through whippings and beatings and, and betrayals and, and everything else you can imagine. He ain't going to get rid of him that easily. And then we will hung him on a cross three days. He came back. And even after that, he gave us the Holy Spirit to continue our journey with us. We can't get rid of that. It's not going to happen. Even in Romans, it tells us that nothing can separate us from the love of God. That's one of my favorite verses, passages for funerals, because it's so true that their relationship that God has forged with us over years and years and centuries will never end because of something I did because I don't have that much control. I can ignore, I can try to throw them off under the bus, whatever I want, but it's still going to be there. It's just a matter of deciding for myself if I want to follow and be part of this faith and be part of this journey, this journey that gives me riches, not so much money, but riches of relationships with people. Challenges of, of things that I may not be challenged for, the good and the bad. All of it in the parameters of my relationship with God and God's steadfast love for me to, to guide me through things, to help me with my burdens, to speak the truth in my mind, to have people speak the truth to me about what I'm doing, what I need to be doing, and what can be done. To make my faith more, what word am I looking for? You probably have it already in your mind. More complete, more fulfilled, stronger. And what's next? The question in our minds, what is next? We don't know what's next. That is the, the beauty of faith. The challenge of faith and the beauty of faith. We don't know what's next. Life is strange that way. We hear on Wednesday that my, Kelly's grandmother need needs to go to hospice care. Okay, the roller coaster's going down. We all ex experience that. You go on Thursday to meet her. She's sitting up in her IC, ICU room watching TV. The price is right. Okay. She's talking. She's coherent. Her, blood, her, 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 her statistics are, are fine. And the ICU nurses don't know what to do with her because they've never had anybody to transport to a rehab center from ICU. What is that all about? Life is strange. We don't know what's going to happen next. Even today, we, we don't know when we visit her in Madison what's, what, what she's going to be like. That's part of the journey that we have. We're journeying together with that. The prayers that you have for all the people on the prayer requests and the prayer requests of other churches, of other peoples, matters because it shows a unity in Christ relationships even though we don't know each other personally in these prayer requests there is a strength a bond that we can't break it's a sense of love that they talk about in Corinthians that without that nothing matters all those other stuff is just waste we care we convince we follow we lead, we journey together, and Christ is at the lead. We can't throw him off the cliff because he can't, we don't, can't get rid of him that easily. He's with us no matter what, through thick and thin, expressing himself through other people, through other circumstances. I read in the 
last week, the devotional books that struck me right to my heart. How does that work? You struggle with an issue, you read it, the devotion, it speaks right to it like that. You've all experienced that too. This really spoke to me today because I was struggling with this and all of a sudden I read this or someone said something or we're not alone. God is always active in our lives, always expressing something for us to grab on to, to hold on to, to know that we're not alone. The prayer chains, the people, the spirit within us, the promises of Jesus that we're never going to be alone. And he's always with us. And so our and turns into amen because we know that Jesus is leading us and we are following. Thanks be to God. Amen.